I'm Dr. George Shapiro. We're here at the Age Management Medicine Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, where physicians from all over the world look at new advances in technology in genomics, epigenetics, uh, and age management medicine. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hareri, who is our keynote speaker this year. Dr. Hareri, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in health and longevity? Sure. So uh, I've actually spent uh, the last 30, uh, 30 years in medicine um, first, I, uh, I was, a, I was a, a neurosurgeon focused on trauma. Uh, I uh, spent a great deal of my time looking at the mechanisms of inflammation and how they played a role in how the brain responded to injury. And during that work, became really interested in stem cells. Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, I started a company which interrogated the leftovers of birth to find the best stem cells for developing into, into medicines. And uh, I was very fortunate. I assembled a great research team. We, um, we created an entire platform around placental stem cells. I was very fortunate to be acquired by uh, perhaps the most exciting biotechnology company in the world, Celgene Corporation, and over the last 15 years have built the world's uh, leading stem cell cell cellular medicine business. Um, during that time, I was very, very uh, lucky to get my good friend and, and someone who I admire tremendously, Dr. Craig Venter, interested in, in looking at how stem cells might in fact be an, an interesting research platform and potentially a therapeutic for treating age-related changes. And as the pioneer in genomics uh, got together with me, someone who's spent my career in stem cells, and we decided to create a company called Human Longevity. Human Longevity is a, an information and therapeutics company that's focused on interrogating those changes that occur in the genome and that are associated with discrete either diseases or degenerative processes that we can target for intervention. And the way I see those interventions being deployed is using cellular medical products. Um, I think stem cells represent one of the most uniquely powerful sets of natural tools that can restore protein synthetic function, um, uh, the release of factors which stimulate endogenous processes like renovation and repair, uh, and they have a remarkably high safety profile. So that's what brought me into this, into this Congress. So, you know, as a practicing physician for, for over 25 years focusing in on cardiology and uh, so my early years have been involved in uh, heart transplantation at Columbia University in New York. You know, as an office-based physician, how can this help us with patients? We're, we're at a remarkable time in biomedicine. We are on the threshold of being able to utilize the most sophisticated molecular analytic techniques in the form of genomic screening, whole genome sequencing, in the form of metabolomics, in the form of microbiomics to allow us to better understand what is being produced and secreted in our bodies and how are those molecules driving processes? How can we intervene clinically to maximize the performance of our organs and tissues in order to preserve a youthful phenotype? You know, the body is really remarkable. It goes from this, this, this infant form to an elderly infirmed form over the span of 60, 70, 80 years and that morph morphing from those different forms is a, is a really a process of renewal and replacement. If we can understand those mechanisms, maybe we can slow it down. Maybe we can arrest it and preserve a youthful phenotype. And that's what our objectives are. And in, the, and in your office environment, what you can do is now direct your patients. Let's get a look at your genome. Let's get a look at your metabolome. Let's understand the microbiome and its influences on your body. And then we, if we find some discrete, discrete changes that we can address with a therapeutic like stem cells, let's give it a shot. All right, so, so as a patient coming into the office, I, I like to take a look at their genome. Is it a blood test? Is it a urine test, a saliva test? What's the actual process? 
So fortunately, you can recover intact DNA from many different sources. The conventional, traditional way that we'll be, we'll be offering uh, whole genome sequencing is on a standard blood draw. We'll isolate cells from those cells, we'll isolate the DNA and run it through the sequencing equipment. And the challenge is after you get that DNA, after you get that information, is to apply high performance computational analyses in order to better understand what all that data means. So the future, uh, how, do you, how do you vision the future of all this technology? You know, I think the future is here. I think that you know, we, we will soon see whole genome sequencing, microbiomic sequencing, metabolomics deployed in the general average everyday practice. As I, as I w mentioned in my, in my, uh, in my uh, keynote, um, the cost of genome sequencing since, since Craig Venter uh, was the first to do it was $100 million. Today it's under 1,000. And it's predicted that this number will drop. Under $100 genome sequence, is that possible? Absolutely. And remember, like everything else, as the technology increases and is democratized, as my, as my dear friend Peter Diamandis always says, the great thing about technology is that as it is deployed and as it is advanced, you, you, you are able to distribute it to a broader population of people at a lower and lower cost with greater and greater returns on the investment. What do you think about the Age Management Medicine Group and how we're bringing physicians together to learn the new medicine, advanced medicine, instead of what physicians, you know, looking at textbooks written 30 years ago, looking at old technology, we're really looking to be very proactive, prevent disease. What, what do you think of this group? You know, I'm excited that there is a clinical community that says, you know what, we're not going to accept the status quo. We're, we don't like, I was very, I was moved and inspired by the, the address from the Mintz Award winner that he, as, a, as someone who operated in the, in the critical care environment, the acute medicine, emergency medicine environment, he felt dissatisfied that his patients, even the ones he saved, weren't saying, listen, I feel better. I think that if we, if we direct our attention at ways to intervene before disease manifests itself, if we can intervene with patients and, and redirect them, uh, and you know we can do that, right? I mean, I mean people who take, take care of their cardiovascular system and intervene early, they don't suffer the ravages of heart disease by changing diet, by changing lifestyle. We can do it, and, and this medicine group, the Age Management Medicine Group, you guys are committed to this. So, so for me, it's, it's exciting to be, to be even part of this. Right, you know, it's interesting, this, uh, the Alan Mintz Award, he was the physician who brought me from New York to Vegas and discussed this whole program and started me uh, in this 10 years ago. It's just, it's just great the way medicine has advanced. You know, as long as, long as, as physicians take an evidence-based approach and they, and they use rigorous science, to test their hypotheses and confirm it and then apply it to their practice, we're gonna, we're gonna do, do our, our job to advance healthcare, improve the lives of our patients, and improve the overall fundamental functioning of our industry. You know, one of the, one of the uh, fields that we're very interested in is sarcopenia and, and frailty. And as you age, you start to lose muscle. Uh, I know you uh, have a lot to do with Myos Corporation. You started that company. Can you talk a little bit about muscle physiology and how you, and you got into it from your days of being a military aviator uh, and looking at traumatic brain injury with the, vet, with the veterans? So here's the remarkable thing. Muscle represents 50% of the wet body mass of any, any individual. And it is, it is a highly active metabolic organ. It's responsible for secreting its entire, entire array of proteins that influence other systems like the heart, like the brain. Um, interestingly enough, the one therapeutic approach to treating early onset Alzheimer's disease that categorically works is to place patients on a vigorous exercise program. Exercise, healthy muscle, the products of healthy muscle, dramatically improve general physiology. Sarcopenia is that disorder we should be paying attention to because you can intervene early. There are already approaches, therapeutic approaches, nutritional approaches, dietary supplement approaches, which significantly change the, the directionality of that disorder, can reverse it. So I say this is, what, this is the low-hanging fruit for this group, for AM, AMMG. They can apply their attention 
to identifying the loss of muscle sarcopenia early, intervening with safe and effective therapeutic modalities, and, and the, the net effect of that, the consequence of doing that is general health will improve. If you have healthy muscle mass, your incident, the incidence of type 2 diabetes is reduced. Immune function improves with healthy muscle mass. Cardiovascular function improves. And there's, there's a wealth of data being generated that shows that healthy muscle tissue directly correlates to healthy brain function. You know, from uh, my experience with uh, muscle physiology, hormone optimization, uh, exercising frequently, you know, you notice three days after you exercise, you tend to lose muscle. Our body has regulatory mechanisms. Can you talk about a little bit about that, the regulatory mechanisms involved in muscle? It turns out that um, the body has a very complex, highly orchestrated biofeedback series of mechanisms that are meant to maintain a homeostatic situation. We have a protein in our body called myostatin, and myostatin is designed to maintain a balance between skeletal integrity and muscular strength. And the problem is that as we age, for mechanisms that are not fully understood, we actually have a decline um, in our muscle mass while myostatin levels are rising. A simple intervention is to, is to selectively block myostatin in order to get better returns in exchange for exercise, good nutrition, and so on. The net effect of that is that you improve overall health and physiology. A big part of this conference yesterday was on the inflammation track. And uh, can you comment a little bit about myostatin's role with inflammation in the body? It's a great point, George, and, and you and I have discussed this over the, over the years. The truth is that inflammation and the growth differentiation factor of molecules, myostatin is part of the TGF beta family of regulatory proteins as well. These systems have a complex interplay with one, one another. And there's no doubt in my mind that, that inhibition of myostatin creates a, a, a metabolic state in the body which is anti-inflammatory. We already know that in one product, one dietary supplement product, um, uh, fortitropin, that this compound, th this composite of proteins and lipids not only interferes with myostatin in a safe, reversible manner, but it also has anti-inflammatory effects that are, that are measured by the reduction in inflammatory markers in the bloodstream. So, you know, I, I think we're at the, we're at the, at the dawn of taking approaches that look at these regulatory systems um, with, with good science, high quality clinical investigations, and we'll be able to direct our patients to things before they break down. Uh, the American College of Cardiology, where I'm a fellow of, has new guidelines to start statin therapy. You know, they're recommending six months of uh, lifestyle modifications first, which is really what we try to tell our patients to really change them. You know, but at one point, just changing your lifestyle and exercising can't do it. So, you know, we, we believe optimizing hormones are a big part of this. What is your uh, feed, you know, uh, what do you think about uh, this approach? You know, I think that, that when we fully understand the healthy youthful phenotype and we can identify specific factors which are correctable, modifiable, adjustable, um, Taking an approach to do that clinically makes sense. Hormone replacement therapy has been a standard practice in, um, in the gynecologic management of, of, of postmenopausal, perimenopausal women. It makes sense to me that an identifiable deficiency in male hormones um, can, in fact, be, be addressed by correcting that. And there's, there's a growing um, a database of men on hormone replacement therapy having significant metabolic and physiologic benefits and gains from doing that. I, so, so it makes complete sense to me. I think that, that there, some of the solutions that we're looking at in using cellular medicine may in fact do the very similar sorts of things. So at the end of the day, um, this, this, is, this is the way we move the bar. This is the way we, as a, as a biomedical community, work to improve the quality of health in the aging population with solutions that are at our fingertips, with products that have you know, long-standing uh, histories of, of, uh, of safety and, and activity, and, and, and it, it makes sense to me. So one last thing, we, we spoke about single nucleotide polymorphisms, and you mentioned that in your lecture today. 
if we do a blood test on a patient, we get their SNP test. Uh, what do you think about sending that to the laboratory, looking at a genetic deficiency in some nutritional uh, vitamins or nutritional compounds like vitamin B6 and so on? What do you think about personalizing some uh, new formulations for patients specific to their deficiency? I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, again, the ultimate objective of, of, of genomic medicine is to identify the ideal environment for the specific phenotype. So an individual who has, uh, has a specific set of polymorphisms that make them sensitive to deficiencies in a, a cofactor or a mineral or a vitamin, if you can identify that, the intervention's easy, right? The intervention's simple. And I say that, you know, because because we don't go out and hunt our food and gather our, gather our, our nutrients, we buy, we buy prepackaged, prepared materials, we don't often get the benefit of the natural drive to include things in our diet. We all know that um, cravings, <laughs> the traditional uh, uh, biologic response to a deficiency is to crave that food, right? Right, right. right. So, so why, not, why not assist patients? by providing them with the right customized set of nutrients, supplements, cofactors, minerals, enzymes in order to maximize their health. It makes a lot of sense.